for reference, I'm a female, and I was 19 years old at the time. I love camping. Anytime my friends and I came home from college, we would load up our cooler with beer, grab some gear, and go screw around outside. Unfortunately, when I was actually at school, none of my sorority sisters or other friends ever wanted to go with me, so I would often suffer withdrawals from camping. One day, the weather was way too nice to waste, so I grabbed some of my gear, hopped in a car I borrowed from a buddy of mine, and drove to a spot that was secluded, yet within a safe distance to civilization that I could run and get help if I needed it. Camping also creeps me out sometimes, but that creepy feeling is also somewhat a plus for me. It's the same reason that people read these stories. It's fun to be scared. So I make a little camp and get a fire going. I hadn't brought all that much to eat, but I was enjoying myself, reading and looking around the area, that sort of thing. I got the feeling I was being watched, and I stopped dead in my tracks. I hear a twig crunch over to my right, then I see a doe bolt from a hundred feet or so in front of me. I laughed at myself and went back to the camp with the armful of wood that I had gathered. I kept freaking myself out, hearing sounds just outside of the ring of light cast by the fire. I always get inside my head, so I shrugged it off and kept whittling at a stick that I'd been messing with. Around one, I decided to go into my tent and snuff out the lantern. I had been slamming beers in the most unladylike fashion and smoking cheap cigars. Another reason I like camping, I can act however I want. So I passed out relatively quickly. About two, I start hearing footsteps. They sound pretty light and sort of timid as well. I think to myself that it's a deer or it's another animal more likely a raccoon, because I had probably left some food out. I still, of course, am on guard, and about 30 minutes of sleeping, with one eye open, I hear a rubbing noise, and the tent fabric is being pushed in a bit. I don't know how I didn't shit my sleeping bag, but I just sat there paralyzed with my cab bar in my hand. I desperately wanted to thrust the knife through the tent fabric, but I was still holding out hope that it was some of my buddies from a frat joking with me. And then as suddenly as it had begun, it all stopped. I was starting to feel slightly more secure because daylight would be coming in about two or three hours, but I sure as shit wasn't going to go to sleep. All of a sudden, at about four o'clock, I realized I should put boots on so that if anything did happen, I would be ready to go. After having stayed up and keeping alert a little while longer, my friend's car alarm goes blaring. I freak the hell out and run out of the tent. I got about two steps. Before something grabs me around the mouth, I open my mouth to scream, but instead, the person's pinky finger slips between my teeth. I've heard that people can perform superhuman feats when they have huge adrenaline rushes, and in my case, I just clamped down, and there's no way to say this without sounding ridiculous, his finger popped off. He screamed, pulled his hand away with the missing digit falling to the ground. He took off running down the hill I was camping on. I took off to the right quickly in the opposite direction. I must have looked ridiculous to the people whose house I ran to, a little sorority girl in a wife beater, boxers, and steel toe boots. I also had some blood that had oozed out of my lip, not from the finger, mind you, but because I had also managed to take a pretty good chunk out of my lip as well. I told them what happened, they called the police, got me some real clothing, and the man at the house made me a whiskey and coke. When the cops got there, they checked it out. The cops went to check it out. 
and when they came back, it was light out. They brought me back so I could get my friend's car, and what I saw just made me more scared. Right next to the tent was a red gas can. He could have just lit me on fire earlier. The finger was also gone, suggesting he had come back for it. The kicker is they never caught the guy. So somewhere out there is a man sitting down to dinner, maybe alone, maybe with a wife and a couple of kids, and he's missing his right pinky. This is my second post on this subreddit. It happened to me and the man I was dating back in late spring of 2000. I am an avid and experienced urban explorer. I visit many different abandoned sites. This place I'm writing about has been explored several times by others since, but when I visited, it wasn't a common knowledge location and all the buildings were still intact, except for the main house, which had, from what I had heard, burned, leaving nothing but the outer stone wall. And nothing but the outer wall remains. All the other buildings were torn down since I was there. To more recent urban explorers, it is known as the Stone Castle, and more recently, the Ostler Castle. This is the name given by the Heritage Society that has decided to fix it up. When my boyfriend at the time discovered it, he saw it in the distance from a roof he was working on in Oromindante, Ontario. There was, but not anymore, a large barn, a carriage house, and towards the back of the property, a stable. The first weekend we both had off together, we made the hour drive to explore it. The property was absolutely stunning. On the top of a hill, back from the road, you could almost imagine living surrounded by such beauty, and we did exactly that. The house itself was gone, except for the wall, and if you looked in the basement window, you could see an old stove laying amongst the wreckage. You could tell it had been a beautiful home at one time, to whom over-owned it. Being the explorer I was, I insisted that we investigate every single corner of every single building that was on the property, and although my ex was less than enthusiastic about it, I insisted. I honestly did not see the point of driving for an hour just to look at the outside of the buildings. No, I had to go inside the buildings too. The first building we explored was the barn, both upstairs and downstairs. Down in the basement of the barn is where things went from wow to holy shit really fast. In the basement, it had been used as a place for satanic sacrifices. There was satanic artwork all over, a knife with what appeared to be blood on it, and an altar with black candles, a bottle of what smelled like blood. The most disturbing piece was that whatever satanic group was using it, they had built a makeshift cage out of the silo with chains inside and everything. My boyfriend at the time wanted to get the heck out of there as fast as possible, but I convinced him to stay so we could explore the rest of the buildings on the property. I told him it was probably just a bunch of kids. They were just screwing around. No big deal, right? Wrong. Our next stop was the stables at the back of the property, and honestly, I was so caught up in my love for exploring that he would not have been able to persuade me to leave without going in every single building no matter what. I opened the door into the stable, and the smell hit me, rotting flesh. The entire room was littered with animal corpses, dogs, cats, rabbits, even coyotes and foxes. They had been horribly mutilated. 
It was absolutely the worst thing I have ever laid my eyes on. As soon as my boyfriend saw that, he grabbed me and said that we were leaving right at that moment and that killing animals is not stupid kids doing stupid things. This is some serious stuff. So we started to leave, but there was one more building I wanted to check on the way out the carriage house. He said, no way were we going there and stomped off up the hill back to the main house, assuming I would follow. I didn't follow. I went around the hill by myself and took a quick peek in the carriage house. The carriage house was anticlimactic. It had absolutely nothing in it. It's actually a good thing that I snuck off like I did, because if I hadn't, we wouldn't have seen them coming. They would have been able to sneak up on us as we were coming up the hill and do God knows what to us. The first one I noticed was an adult male with a baseball bat. He actually had opened our car door and was rifling through the things in our car, trying to find a key, I'm guessing. There were about eight people in total in the group, ranging from adults, I would say in their thirties, to teenagers and children no more than twelve or thirteen years of age. They all had weapons, golf clubs, sticks, a cane, and baseball bats. I yelled at the guy, what the hell do you think you're doing going through our car? And my boyfriend came charging over the hill, bless his heart, right through the posse of creeps and weirdos who seemed to be lying in wait for us. It appeared that we had ruined whatever plans they had in mind because they immediately backed off. Some even tried to hide their weapons behind their backs, which was just stupid if you ask me. Who wouldn't notice a baseball bat behind somebody's back? Baseball bat guy demanded to know what we were doing there, and I demanded to know what the hell he thought he was doing in our car. He didn't answer, just looked at me all nervous. My ex-boyfriend said we were just admiring the architecture of the house and that we were just leaving and they let us get into our car and drive off, which is in itself a miracle. I'd say in light of what we had just discovered on the property, they followed us in a black pickup with no plates for a good solid 20 minutes. Instead of heading for home, we went to the closest city, which was Barrie, Ontario filed a report with a policeman who seemed more shaken than us and then headed home. My ex never went back to that roofing job again. He had someone else finish it and he went to another one. I wanted to go back, but after telling people what happened, I couldn't find anyone to go with me. My ex and I continued various explorations, but we both started carrying knives with ourselves. I still carry one to this day even when I hike. I have not read of anyone else having similar experiences at Satan's castle. Recently, my cousin, who is also an explorer, contacted me with a place she wanted to explore. Guess where? And guess what? We have made arrangements to go there in the next couple of weeks. So, on that note, and many years later, Satan's castle cult Let's hope we don't meet again. And to any other urban explorers out there, please, be careful. You never know what you might come across in those abandoned buildings. This is my first time posting anything here, but I feel like I have an interesting story to share. I've always wanted to turn it into a book or something, but I've been super busy with school. To start out, this story sort of takes place on and off again throughout most of my life. It starts out as a typical, my parents got a divorce when I was young situation, but it unfolded into so much more. In fact, I'm still picking up pieces of everything that happened. 
Just a warning, this is a super long story. I don't blame you if you lose interest halfway in. There is a lot of backstory that I do feel is important to understanding what happened. As it stands now, my father is dead. It was ruled a suicide, but I think that was only half of what happened. I'll talk about everything that led up to this, but more importantly, I believe that Mary definitely had a hand in what happened. Anyway, my mother and father divorced when I was around four years old. Almost everyone I know has gone through some sort of similar situation. I have two brothers, one older and one younger. We saw him about every other weekend. He paid child support. You get the gist. One weekend visit, my father introduces us to a woman he's seeing, named Mary. Her eyes and hair are dark, and her skin is pale. She had an obsession with the color red. Something was immediately off to me, but I didn't really start to know what she was capable of until later. I don't know it at the time, but Mary is one of the main reasons my parents got divorced. My father cheated on my mother with her. He met her while he was working as a waiter at a Red Lobster. When he moved over to his career at a casino as a slot machine repairman, she followed. Mary would follow my dad everywhere. They got married pretty quickly after my mother and father divorced. I never even knew there was a wedding until later. My mother hated her, but she never badmouthed my father or Mary in front of my brothers and I. She felt that it was important for us to make judgments for ourselves, even if this woman was part of the reason her marriage was broken up. We continued to visit what was now Dad and Mary's house on our scheduled time with Dad. I always associated their house with Red. Their house was always decorated with strawberries. Mary liked red sheets. She had red sweaters and pants. It was weird. Mary was just unnecessary drama for a while. Things like buying us toys that we could only keep at Dad and Mary's house, or saying that she and my father wanted custody of us instead of my mom. I felt like these things were harmless in a way. Every divorcing couple probably has some sort of variation. Things carried on like this for a couple of years. We would have a special variation of Christmas or Easter or whatever aside from what we celebrated with my mother. I was about seven or eight years old when I remember the first incident that confirmed that I knew that this wasn't right. My little brother was a super curious child and he was about four years old. He had scooted a dining table chair to the fridge to get a cereal box on top and when he reached up, he pulled out a handgun instead of the cereal box. I panicked and got my dad, who acted really funny about it. My memory is fuzzy, but I remember going home early that weekend. My dad didn't know the gun was there because it was Mary's. It was at this point that my mom started to have trouble with us going over there. My father got worse about being able to come pick us up. He was unreliable for the most part to begin with, but I know that he was ten times worse when he was around Mary. My mom told me later, when I was much older, that Mary called our house around the time of the gun incident and said, I want your life. My mother is a really tough lady. She grew up in East LA in California. This scared her. She was going to get a restraining order soon. I guess what Mary meant was that she wanted my mom's stability. Even as a single mom with three kids, she was doing very well for herself. And even dating too. But even so, how long has she obsessed with my mom before she and my father ever got divorced? What? Did that even mean? Not long after the phone call, 
My mom heard her car being smashed into one evening. Someone had taken a brick and smashed the driver window. Nothing was taken. I know it was Mary. We had no way to prove it, of course, but I just know. My dad and Mary had a baby. Her name is Madison. I only remember holding slash playing with her for so long. I can't imagine all the stuff that she's been through. My mom met and married my stepdad pretty soon after that, and they decided that it would be best to move to Florida. We had other family there, and there weren't many jobs where we were living in Tennessee. I don't remember any problems at all when we were so far from dad and Mary. We stayed for about a year, and then we moved back to Tennessee. My stepdad was able to get a better job again, and we were closer to my mom's parents. This is when the phone calls start. As soon as we moved back, we would get phone calls where someone would just listen for a few minutes and then hang up. The numbers were always blocked, but I'm sure it was her. She always knew where we lived because we started seeing my dad again. The calls continued for years. It actually became sort of like an inside joke. We all knew who it was, but there wasn't anything that we could do. My father denied it, and any time I asked him about it, he took her side. We fell into this thing where my mom was the bad guy, and any time I questioned my dad and Mary's behavior, they were sure my mom was putting me up to it. Things escalated one evening when my dad came back to pick us up for a visit. My mom and Mary ended up getting into a fist fight where Mary swung first and my mom punched her so hard that she fell backwards. My brothers and I watched from the apartment we were living in at the time. Mom went immediately to the police but my dad and Mary never even called. My mom didn't press any charges, and the whole incident sort of faded away. We ended up moving into a big house a while after that, where we still are today. Dad and Mary started to have problems, and they split up. I thought maybe she would be gone for good, or at least gone for the most part, but she never really went away. My dad started to become a person that we could somewhat rely on again when she was gone. I got to know my little sister more, the baby they had, and things were okay. She started coming around again though. Whenever she was with my dad in front of us, she would whisper in his ear. My dad would drink more. He became physically ill looking and would start to gain weight. We could always tell when Mary was around because the difference was so drastic. He even officially divorced her at one point, but it was obvious that they still got together on and off. My brothers and I went on with our lives, and we became too old for visiting the way we were. Whole weekend visits became just going to see my dad for an evening. The whole time, however, the phone calls never stopped. They weren't as frequent, mind you, but they were there in the background, like a reminder that she was still lurking there. When I got into high school, visits from my dad just about stopped altogether. We usually talked on the phone here and there, and I saw him when I had events, like a marching band competition, a formal dance, milestones like graduating high school. It was pretty common to go a while without hearing from him sometimes. Mary was only a thought. I hadn't seen her in years. I never saw her anywhere at all. The phone calls had stopped, but only because we had gotten rid of the house phone. I was now a freshman in college, and I remember it being right around Halloween of 2009. I was shopping with my aunt for some cheap decorations at the Walmart, by my house. I saw a woman walking slowly behind us, and Aunt and I both did a double take. It was Mary. 
She was totally following us around to the store. She looked like she was maybe 50 years older than when I last saw her, and her clothing was disheveled as well. My aunt kept elbowing me to go talk to her because we weren't exactly sure if this really was her. I mean, it could have just been someone who looked really similar to her. I worked up the nerve and went up to her. Is your name Mary? I asked. Yes, it is. Hi, Samantha. How are you? Using my name like that really caught me off guard. She knew who I was and wasn't bothering to talk to me. She didn't even act like she was being caught either. I asked her if she had talked to my dad lately because it had been a while since I heard from him. She swore up and down that she hadn't spoken to him for months, which I later found out was a lie. This was the beginning of my dad going missing. After I saw her, something happened and it's hard to pin down what, but he completely disappeared. His cell phone was shut off and when I called his work at the casino where he had been working for over 15 years, they said that he was no longer working there and couldn't tell me why. My mom and brothers and I called the police to file a missing persons report. We didn't have to wait because it had already been several weeks since we had heard from him. They helped us make a flyer and we looked and asked all over. Everything led back to Mary most likely being the one to have last seen him. By the time we started talking to her, it was mid-November. My mother and I called Mary and she told us that she had in fact seen my dad on the night after Halloween. Mary told us that he was making a noose and this would be the last time anyone ever saw him. We honestly didn't know what to believe. My dad was an alcoholic. It wasn't uncommon for him to say dramatic stuff, but we never considered suicide. When we told the detectives what Mary told us, they had her come in for questioning. She had told the detectives a completely different story, and her dates kept changing. There wasn't any evidence of anything though, so there wasn't much that they could do. The detectives did, however, tell us they we shouldn't talk to her anymore. To quote them, we don't know what she's capable of. Things went on like this until they found him on January 4th, 2010. My dad was found dead in a storage unit. He had pulled his car in, shut the unit door, and let it run until he died, and he had been there for 63 days. There were several notes, all dated for November 2nd, one for my mom, one for each of his children, but there was an especially long note for Mary where he dotted on her and talked about what a wonderful woman she was. The note even said for her to take any insurance money and use it on herself. The date on the notes was so close to the date where Mary said she had seen him. There are a million things that could have happened, but I know that she had something to do with it. Even if my father really did kill himself, I know that she helped push him over the edge. I'm not one to just blame someone. I know my father was a troubled man. He was an alcoholic and he was depressed most of the time, usually because of Mary. But there's something so frustrating and horrendous about this woman and there's zero evidence for me to prove anything against her. She wasn't allowed to come to the funeral though. My mom and parts of his family put everything together. There wasn't anyone he knew that hadn't heard of her, and everyone felt that she was a bad woman. I found a Facebook profile of hers months after they found my dad. There were only five or six photos of her, and also some guy obviously happy, and they were all dated for January 4th, 2010. The next year, on January 4th, 2011. She showed up at my family's house. We didn't let her in the house and she kept saying something about having some stuff on my dad's in the car. We told her to leave or else we would call the police. That night, someone put red tissue paper in and around our mailbox. Even the next year, 
2012. She called my mom and asked her to meet her in his Sonic Burger parking lot. She said she had a box of my dad's stuff to give us. My mom made my stepdad go instead of her, but she never showed up. I feel like she wanted to do something bad to my mother. The following year, we didn't hear from her. I did some research, and it turns out that she was put in jail for making meth. It made a lot of sense for some of the things, but I still have so many questions and issues that are unanswered. Supposedly, she was let out sometime last year, summer of 2014 I think. The correctional facility that she was at has a website, and it says that she was let out for good behavior and rehab as well. I found a different Facebook that showed her with some other family. God help them if she's pulling the same crap as she did with mine. Today, I have no idea where she is, and until I can move far away, I don't want to see Mary ever again. Update 8515 I just wanted to update this while it's still fresh in my mind. My little brother received a visit from Scary Mary in person. My little brother works at a video game store. It was around 8pm last night, 8 4, 15, and Madison, Mary's daughter, came in to buy a video game. My little brother was shocked and he didn't recognize her. She introduced herself and my little brother couldn't do much. She asked for his phone number, but my brother didn't end up giving it to her because he had a weird feeling in his stomach. She took what she bought and left, and my little brother thought that was the end of it. But maybe five to ten minutes later, in walks Madison again, with Mary by her side. My little brother immediately recognized her and started to panic. Mary and Madison stood at the back of the store, whispering to each other. He said that they were both smiling the whole time, and a couple of times, they giggled to each other. Mary then looked him right in the eyes, and started to head towards the counter my brother was behind. He said that he felt so angry, and his heart started to race. Instead of trying to confront her, he walked into the back of the store, and let his co-worker ask if he could help her. Maybe ten minutes later, she was now gone, and his co-worker told him that she left without asking for anything. My brother thinks that she was just making her presence known, and that she thought she could catch up with them like they were friends or something. I just know that I don't want this woman in my life anymore. I don't want her harassing my family members, and I want to move as far away as possible. We documented this incident with the police department, and they said that if it happens three times, then we can file a restraining order. I don't really know what else to do. Anyway, I just thought this might be something you guys are interested in hearing. As much as I thought it finally might be over, she pops right back up again. It's not enough for her that my dad is dead. I guess she wants to have the last word. She always wanted to have the upper hand. But yeah, I'll keep everyone updated if I find out even more. Before anything, a little bit of backstory. I was 10 at the time and was visiting my hometown, Ecuador, for the summer. At the time, I knew just about everyone in my small little town, and so did my parents, which is why they let me go on my own that day. Anyway, here is my encounter. Back when I was 10 years old, my family decided to take a visit to my hometown of Ecuador. We went for the summer and planned out just about our whole stay. One day, my mom and dad were getting ready to go to a wedding and I was in the house with them. My big sister went over to her friend's house 
and my other relatives had already left for the wedding. I was supposed to stay at home, alone for the duration, but I saw that it was a beautiful day out and decided to ask my mom and dad to go to a park that was no more than two blocks away. They were reluctant at first, stating that there would be nobody to take care of me, but I argued that it was a beautiful day out and there was no way that the park would be empty. They kept getting dressed as I kept on arguing, until they finally gave in. They said that I can go to the park as long as I was back before dark. I agreed and ran outside to head for the park. It took me no more than 10 minutes to get there, and I was ready to make new friends and play around. But oddly enough, there was nobody else in the park. It looked abandoned, which was weird seeing how this was one of two parks in the whole city. It should have been packed, but I paid no mind to it. I believe I ran over to a swing set, or slide, it was 12 years ago, I can't remember that detail, and played around. As I played, I suddenly heard a voice from the distance. A clown was on the other side of a gate and emotioning for me to get closer. Behind him was a white van, which I would noticed before, but just thought it was a delivery truck of sorts. I slowly started walking towards the clown and stopped a good distance away from him. He asked me, in Spanish, Hey kid, do you like clowns? I nodded to him and he gave me that clown frown and then said, well, then let me see if I can change that. He opened up his car, and by looking inside, I saw there were only two boxes, though I wasn't sure what they were filled with, and that was it. No seats, no posters, just those two boxes, and then complete emptiness. Being a child, I still paid a no mind to it, and watched as he pulled out a deflated balloon. He wrapped his lips around the end and blew until the balloon was fully inflated. He tied the end and started to form the balloon into a balloon animal of a dog. He showed it to me, and I smiled. He then motioned me to come over, to which I complied. He handed the balloon to me and said, Do you like it? I nodded yes this time, and gave him a little smile. He then grinned in the creepiest way possible. The grin was so creepy that even as a kid, I knew to back away a bit. The clown then said that if I wanted to see the rest of his tricks, I would have to get into the truck. I told him that the exit was on the other side of the park and I wouldn't be able to climb the small gate. He then said the few words that haunt me to this day. Get a little closer and I'll carry you over. Then we can have loads of fun in my truck. Come on, kid. While saying this, he still had that creepy grin and plastered across his face. I merely backed away and told him, No, it's okay, sir. His grin turned into anger, as though he was annoyed at this. He placed his hands on his hips and said to me, Aw, but we were going to have so much fun. Right when he said that, I heard a voice on the other side of the park yelling, Son? Son, I'm here to pick you up. I turned and saw a man that I recognized as a local neighbor. He was not my real father, obviously, but the little me knew to run over to him. I said nothing more to the clown. I just ran to the man and gave him a hug. The man waved to the clown and said, Thanks for keeping my kid entertained. To which the clown replied, No problem. As we turned around, I was able to hear this man murmur. I looked at him and said, Sir, what exactly is going on? He gave a sigh and explained everything. As it turns out, that was no real clown. He was a man that had been kidnapping kids across all of Ecuador. He would lure kids with the clown costume and then take him away to God knows what places. The people of my town had a feeling he was coming to our town, which was why the whole park was deserted. He said that he was walking by when he noticed that I was talking to the clown, 
and ran over to basically save me. As he told me this, he also dialed for the police to report the incident. We had finally arrived in my house, and this man said, Be careful with who you talk to, son. Not everyone is who they seem. I gave him one final hug, and gave him a thanks for saving me from that sick bastard. He gave me a rub on the head and said, It's okay, my boy. Now, hurry on in. I have my own things to worry about. I nodded and ran in the house. Nobody was there, and by the time they had returned, I decided not to tell anyone, since I knew they'd flip out. It took a while to forget about the whole incident, especially with those words that kept reminding me of him, but I soon forgot, till I came across this page, and memories of that clown flooded my head. I'm not quite sure what happened to the sicko, but hopefully he is now behind the bars. Hopefully. So, to that creepy clown from long ago, let's not meet. I've been running in these woods for as long as I can remember, but this might make me change my mind. The story began at around 6.30 p.m. I had finished eating and decided to go on a run as usual. I always use the same path, cross the street, run for about a kilometer, and pass the gate that goes into the woods. Something important to note is that the trail I use in the forests is separated about halfway through. One path is paved, and the other isn't. I usually go into the unpaved path first, and then turn into the paved one after about three kilometers. Nothing ever really goes wrong. I meet some rare people walking their dogs, but other than that, I'm pretty alone. At least, I thought I was. I had been running for a while now, when I heard a notification coming from my phone. An airdrop notification. Since I didn't want to make it look like I was worried, I kept running for a couple of minutes, and then stopped to change the music. I use air quotations there. I opened the airdrop dreadfully. Who the hell was sending me stuff? I was pretty sure I was alone. I clicked on the drop, and... My heart sunk. It was a Snapchat picture of me running with the caption that read, You look good. I didn't turn around. Instead, I kept running like nothing happened until I reached a certain point. You see, the forest is surrounded by a fence to stop children from coming in unsupervised. And I didn't like that rule when I was little, so my friends and I cut a hole in it. When I was aligned with that hole, I quickly turned and buried myself into the forest, aiming for my escape. I could hear ruffling behind me, and I still didn't turn back. When I finally reached the hole, I jumped through it and absolutely booked it to the fire station that was a couple of streets down. The last things I could hear when leaving the forest was an angry huff and metal meeting metal. I still don't know who it was or what they wanted from me, but I never ran in this forest again. So, creepy stalker guy, or whatever you are, I truly hope we never meet. This happened to me this morning, and it reminded me of a story that I saw on Let's Not Meet about the smiling man. So, here it is. I've had a lot of trouble sleeping recently, so a lot of the time, if it gets to 8 or 9 in the morning, I'll stop trying and go get stuff done early. Last night was one of those nights, so I decided to take my dogs for a short early walk in the park beside my house. I'm never afraid of walking at night. I'm tallish and live in a quiet suburb. So the fact that it was dark actually didn't really bother me too much. I head out with my dogs and into the park, which is partially lit by lamps, but still quite dark. When I was a kid, there was this one stretch of unlit pathway 
that used to scare me in the dark, so when I'm walking there, I'm more aware of my surroundings because of that. As we started walking along that bit of path, one of my dogs, Alfie, turns around and starts barking. I turn around and notice a man jogging behind me. As he gets to about 10 feet behind me, he just stops immediately, then starts walking towards me. I have got mild alarm bells already, but I keep calm and nod to him as he walks past me. I couldn't make out his features much, but I did notice that he was staring directly at me, keeping eye contact even as he passed me out. I said a short, how are you?" as he passes, but he just stays completely silent. As soon as he's about 10 feet past me, he starts jogging again, down towards a part of the path lined by trees. I'm properly spooked now, so I take out my phone and send a voice message to my friend group in WhatsApp, explaining to them what had just happened. I'm just done explaining this, and that's when I hear a noise and turn around. This guy is jogging up behind me, again. To give some context, there's only the one path, and he was in front of me. In order to get behind me without me seeing him, he would have had to have run to the area under the trees, turned around, crept past me across the grass quietly, and then come back up the path behind me. I turn around and watch him come up to me, stop jogging, walk past. I say the same short sentence again, and then he jogs off. I decide I'm getting back to my house, but the little laneway that leads to my road is up ahead, which means I have to keep walking the same way. I get about 50 meters up that stretch of path, in between the lampposts, when Alfie starts making grumbling, pre-bark noises again. I look up, and there he is up ahead of me, just standing beneath one of the orange lights, looking in my direction. My heart is thumping, but now I'm definitely gonna keep facing that direction. No way am I turning around. I had seen another guy just riding his bike around the park, and there are houses that connect to it, so I'm not completely isolated, and I've got a big dog. The laneway to my road is just past them, so I let my dogs pull me up the path, and as soon as we get to him, Alfie tried to move toward him. This causes him to have to move and shift position. I pull Alfie away and start talking to the dogs, saying, Okay guys, let's go home. Come on, this way, etc. And I don't stop talking until we get out of the park, feeling my back completely exposed the whole entire time. My house is just across from the laneway, so I make my way really quickly towards the gate. Just as I'm about to put in the code, a loud sound, like a bin falling over, comes from behind me, from the other row of houses, the ones that back onto the park. I spin around to look at my neighbors, in case one of them had opened their door to go to work. Nobody. Not a sound. I put the code into the gate quickly, and make it inside as fast as possible. I went to my room and fell straight to sleep, and I'm never walking in that park alone at night again. That guy was the biggest creep, and I hope I never run into him again. Some crazy people can show it in their eyes, that's for sure. Hello, my story happened at the end of January 2019. I live near a small city in Germany, and I just finished my three and a half years apprenticeship as an electrician. We were at the official ceremony in that city, and then went into a pub after that to continue celebrating. My colleagues and me were drinking until like 4am before I made my way home. I left the keys to my home in my car, so on my way home I wanted to stop by my car to get them. I started walking from the pub and noticed two people were following me. I recognized their faces from the pub before, but I thought they maybe needed to go the same way. It's a safe city and I'm 6 foot 5, 
so I never really had problems with somebody here. After another few hundred meters, I was pretty sure they were following me, and I was proven of that, when they started to shout for me and basically are next to me at this point. Drunk guy number one says, Hey, who are you? Where are you going? Me. I'm calling a taxi and drive home. Drunk guy number one. Where is that home? What were you doing here? We can wait for the taxi with you. Me. Sorry, I'm pretty tired and just want to go home. I don't know you guys, so it doesn't really make sense to wait for the taxi with you. After that, the dudes stopped at a crossing, and I kept on walking just for drunk guy number one to run after me, grab my collar, raised his fist, and ask me something like, what exactly is your plan for life? You tell me now exactly what you have planned in your life. I can see you can make a lot out of your life. We take you with us to station number. They showed you how you can live your life. They showed me too. Now, even though I am tall, I have never been into a fight and I didn't want to try on two guys at once for my first. So basically, I started telling him my plans for life without many details, trying to talk my way out of the situation. To my relief, the other drunk guy too started telling drunk guy one that I have a plan for life and that he doesn't have to worry about my future until guy one let loose of me and hugged me after 20 minutes of this encounter. I had 1110 German slash European version of 911 typed in my phone but also didn't really manage to call them. In the end, I managed to come home safely without much damage, and I guess it was some misleaded soul that in his drunk mind thought he would help someone, but I'm pretty sure the encounter could have gone a different path pretty quickly. I stopped going longer distances like that alone at night, since I really don't want anything like that to happen again. I took most of the dialogue of my voice messages I sent to my class, after the encounter at 4.32 a.m., so it's not 100% accurate, but I remember most of it. I was pretty drunk. Anyway, thanks for listening to my experience. Have a great day, and please, stay safe, everyone. Back when I was younger, around 12 to 13 years old, my three friends and I, also the same age, had a fort right at the tree line by some woods near our neighborhood. Right next to the tree line was a series of fields used for sports, so technically our fort was on that property and not the woods. Separating the woods from the fields was a large chain link fence. One day after a large storm, one of the trees from our fort was knocked over, leaning against the fence. Naturally, as kids, we thought that was awesome, except for ruining part of the fort. We all climbed up on the tree, sat on it, and whatnot. After some time, we were just sitting there having a conversation, when I noticed one of my friends who was not on the tree was looking kind of past us on the other side of the fence. Uh... Guys? He said in a shaky tone. We all turn around, and on the other side of the fence, about 20 feet away, was an old man. He was dressed in tattered clothing, including a newsboy hat. He looked to be in his mid-fifties to sixty. He stood there smiling at us. I definitely sensed some malicious intent with him, which is creepy in itself. But the part that gets to me the most was how long he must have been there watching us. Easily 15 to 20 minutes before my friend noticed, in what seemed like forever. None of us spoke, and all we could do was stare back at him. My adrenaline kicked in, and my reaction was just to run away, where my friends also followed. After a few minutes or so, we gained the courage to go back, and when we did, he was gone. It kind of scared us, and we really never went back to that fort. Now the fence is replaced, 
and the fort is gone, but my friends and I will never forget that creepy man. This happened over the last summer here in 2017, and kinda shook me up to be honest. To explain the situation, me and my parents had gone out camping for a week, but my dad still had to work, so all he came to visit during the day that day was leaving the night to work, and then he would come camp with us. Anyway, he leaves and ends up hitting a deer on his motorcycle and being taken to a hospital about an hour away without our knowledge as we had no reception. Eventually, our uncle shows up at a campground and we pack some things up and we quickly go to bring in our vehicle because we weren't going to come back to the campsite. We had our dog with us so we packed some water for her and a tiny bit of food as we knew she would end up mainly being in the car until we had a chance to get home from the hospital to get her home. A bit after we get there and find out what's happening with my dad, I get told to take our dog for a quick walk so she can use the washroom if she needs as she had been in the car for an hour and a half or so at that point. At this point, it's roughly 3 to 4 a.m. and I was alone downtown by the hospital taking her for a quick walk. All was fine and I took her around a few blocks as she hadn't been out of the car in a long time. Eventually, I start walking her back towards the hospital. Now, to get up to the ER entrance, there is a long sidewalk going up an okay sized hill about 30 feet ahead of me, I notice someone walking up towards the hospital the same way I'm heading toward. Naturally, I'm extremely paranoid of people. I read a lot of things from this subreddit and similar stuff. Just people can be insane, especially at 4am in a city I'm not familiar with. Either way, he was ahead of me so I ignored that small paranoia. He reaches the top of the hill before me and is out of sight until I reach the top as well. Keep in mind, I had started to feel a bit anxious and was paying a bit more attention to my surroundings suddenly. As I reach the top of the hill to my right, I see my mom in the ER entrance on her phone through the glass doors and then to my left. There's a road going past the ER, and then a large parkade on the other side of that road. The two buildings caused a lot of shadow in the road there, on the one side, and it was already pretty dark, and the street lights weren't lighting up much in the shadow in the road though. I did notice the man was walking in front of me up the hill. He wasn't walking away anymore though. He had stopped and turned and was staring right at me. I did my best to not immediately speed up or show that I saw him at all, as I knew even if he started towards me, I could easily make it into the hospital before he reached me. So I looked away and kept walking. Right before I reached the doors where my mom was, I looked back again to see if the person was still lurking, and instead, he had came about 15 feet closer and was now standing in the light, staring at me. I was scared as shitless and rushed inside. Nothing else happened, but weird guy in the shadows. Let's not meet. I think this qualifies, if only because it spanned over 10 years and some of the ridiculous lengths things escalated to. Creepy, maybe not, but definitely disturbing in some parts. For brevity's sake, I'm actually going to exclude a lot. These are just the parts I have to include for the whole thing to actually make sense. When I was in kindergarten, I met this woman, I'll call her Mary, 
Apparently, I actually knew her for a while before my first memories of her because she helped out in my Sunday school class. I don't really remember that, to be honest. It's just what was told to me by her and my mother. The first time I remember meeting Mary was when I was walking through the hall of our church. I knew a lot of the adults there, and, generally, I felt pretty safe. I was walking down a hallway when this woman stuck her head out of a supply closet and started talking to me, asking me to come over, and started giving me the whole, you're a good kid, why don't you help me with something sort of spiel, and she knew my name without me telling her whatsoever. I was about five or I just turned six years old, and particularly aware of stranger danger but couldn't decide if I should be creeped out or not. There was this strange lady seemingly hiding in a closet asking me to come over to her. How is that not sketchy? But this was church, and church was supposed to be safe. Somehow she managed to coax me over to the closet. It turned out that she was trying to fill in the birthdays of the kids in my class so that they could be given little gifts when it was their birthday, and she assumed that I would know all their birthdays for some reason. When she found out I didn't, she settled for asking me when my birthday was. I got kind of cagey because I knew better than to give out information about myself, and that was one of the specific things my mother had told me not to divulge to strangers. But when she claimed to already know that my birthday was in April, wrong. In fact, that's about six months off. I told her she was wrong, but didn't feel right about telling her the truth, partly because I felt like her false guess and offers of future birthday gifts was some kind of ploy. But when I wouldn't divulge my real birthday, she called me a liar, and then she threatened to tell all my teachers what a liar I was if I didn't tell her when my real birthday was. That was the point when I ran to go find my mom and explained to her that there was this strange woman in the supply closet who was asking me for personal information and threatening to get me in trouble if I didn't tell her. She came to confront this weirdo, only to realize that they already knew each other. The woman, Mary, was someone who helped around the church and basically everybody knew her. Mary laughed off my claims and assured my mom that I was exaggerating and of course she would never threaten a kid with something like that, and my mother believed her. My mom explained the fact that my birthday was indeed not in April, but came away from the conversation with the idea that I was paranoid and just overreacting to someone asking me for my birth month. Either right before that, or right after, I had another incident with this woman, but didn't realize at the time that she was the same person, similar to before, only not in a closet. This woman Mary came up and struck up a conversation with me, saying that she knew how much I loved to help out my teachers and wouldn't I like to be able to help out even more. The obvious answer was yes. Long story short, she was organizing some kind of teacher's conference in this cabin way out in the woods. They weren't allowed to have a lit sign, but she was worried that a normal cardboard sign wouldn't be visible at night, so she had decided that the best solution would be to take one of the little kids from the church, dress them up in an angel costume, and have them stand next to the sign for hours, using a small switch to turn a lit sign on when cars approached, and then turn it off again so that it wasn't by definition a continuously lit sign. This woman should have worked in cells. I did not see anything wrong with this scenario and excitedly went to tell my mother about this fantastic opportunity that I'd just been given to help someone. She was much less amused, pointing out that this would be outside in October when the average temperature at night is under 55 degrees Fahrenheit. I would be standing outside, alone, freezing my butt off and getting eaten alive by mosquitoes just to flip a switch so that she could bend the rules about not having an electric sign. 
there would apparently be no one there to make sure I was safe from wild animals or any human predator who happened to drive along and spot a random kid out by themselves in the middle of the night. My mom tracked down Mary and gave her a pretty thorough overview of her opinion about the whole thing. Mary said something like, Well, fine, I can just go get some other kid to do it then, which prompted my mother to go to the pastor and tell them what this lady was trying to do. He was a nice guy with three girls of his own and put a stop to the whole plan immediately. I could tell Mary was upset with me afterward for having supposedly told on her and putting an end to this weird scheme of hers, but since I didn't really know her, I didn't care. Of course, after those two incidents, all of my teachers became a lot more chilly toward me and one especially tactless woman flat out told me that she had been warned about me, come to find out that Mary had gotten her revenge on me for effectively embarrassing her twice by making good on her threat to tell everyone that I was a troublemaker and a liar, even though by that point, my mother had already told her that I had been telling her the truth about my birthday not being in April. What a witch. Now, I like to say that it ended there, but of course it did not. My family stayed in the area, and she continued helping with various social functions. So of course we ran into her eventually, after several more times. One of the most outrageous things she ever did, I was 12 years old, and my mother decided to enroll me in some kind of VBS summer school sort of thing. Surprise, surprise. Mary was the main coordinator. This place was so screwed up, not perverted or anything, but just the sheer magnitude of poor planning was incredible. Lunches were provided, but it was weird stuff like gogurt and slimy pears that had a texture like raw fish. Basically, all the kids hated everything they served us. On one occasion, I was served SpaghettiOs and tried to make the best of it because at least it was better than the pears, only to find out that Mary had slipped gummy worms in before microwaving them and they had melted into the SpaghettiOs. When she found out I hadn't liked her prank, she ridiculed me for not being able to take a joke and insisted that I eat it anyway. At some point, it had also been decided that the schedule could not be flexible to any degree. All age groups were expected to get something like half an hour outside every day. Bear in mind the state where this took place has unpredictable, sometimes extreme weather. So this included days when it was pouring rain out and our breath was fogging up in front of our faces. They'd pitch one of those little event canopy tents and force us to sit outside under it in a little plastic chair until our half hour of outdoor play was up. Even this one girl whose father had told the teachers beforehand not to make her go outside because she had a fever. Naturally, she got worse. They called him to come pick her up and he chewed the teachers out before taking her home. It also included days where the temperature exceeded 100 degrees Fahrenheit. We'd be forced to line up alongside the building so that we could stand in the shade of the eaves of the roof because it was physically too hot to be in the sun and none of us had access to water or sunscreen. I wish I was joking about this. We had three kids drop from heat stroke in the same day and have to be taken by ambulance to the hospital. The sheriff personally came out and gave the teachers a massive tongue lashing threatening to shut the place down if any other kids came to the hospital from there. Of course, then they decided it was okay to bend their rules and to keep everyone indoors instead of forcing them outside. There is a point to me mentioning all of this, and that is so that you understand the context behind what happened next. My mother was working overtime, and Mary had volunteered to drive me to the summer camp since she was there every day. On this day, she had her niece and nephews in the back seat with me, where this place was. It was out near the edge of town and mostly surrounded by crop fields which weren't in use. 
The area had a decent amount of traffic, but there weren't many buildings close by. On the left-hand side of the building, there was nothing but fields for maybe two to three acres. On the right-hand side, a tiny farmhouse, and beyond that, a pawn shop, and then a gas station. So I was in the back of Mary's van with these other kids, and we happened to look out as we're passing the pawn shop, which hasn't opened yet, and there's this scraggly bearded man stalking around outside with a rifle or shotgun in his hands. Not like, gee, I wonder if it's open so I can sell my gun, but like he was either the owner and thought an intruder had broken in, or he was the intruder and was in the process of breaking in. We all started telling her in a panic about this guy, and she just tells us to be quiet, and then tells me that she knows I put them up to it, and that when we get there, she's going to tell all the teachers not to listen to me. That day, inexplicably, the schedule that was never changed, unless the sheriff threatened the teachers, was randomly changed so that my class was sent outside immediately, instead of later in the afternoon, and the doors to the building were locked so that we couldn't go back inside, even to use the restroom. I spent like an hour fearing for my life, because I knew that if that guy robbed the pawn shop and tried to escape on foot, there was nowhere for him to run to that had cover except our building. I even begged to call my mom, and Mary refused to let me anywhere near the phone, saying that my mom had better things to do than to be bothered by my stories. So, yeah, basically the coordinator of the summer school changed the whole schedule for the day and locked a bunch of kids outside just to get back at me for, truthfully, reporting and seeing a creepy man with a gun nearby, and also forbid me from contacting my parents, which she was never supposed to be even doing. My mom was ticked off when she picked me up and learned that I had been forbidden from calling her when I felt I needed to, although she didn't realize the full context of the situation until later when I had a chance to explain it better. It, however, doesn't even end there although I wish it did, because the last part was the worst series of events that have ever happened to me. I guess it was kind of a perfect storm of sorts. From 6 to 10 years old, I had been best friends with this boy, whom I'll refer to and call Michael. Not boyfriend, girlfriend, but real, true best friends. I don't think we ever really argued about anything, except maybe his father, who seemed nice, but always seemed to try to spin whatever I said into some kind of innuendo so he could complain about me to my parents. Like, for example, getting on my case about having mentioned the term Pussy Willow. Needless to say, I got some weird vibes from him, but not enough to warrant his own post. Michael and I were inseparable, up until his family decided to move three states away, after which they only occasionally dropped in to visit every couple of years. When I was 14 years old, they dropped in to visit again, and so on Saturday, I was invited to stay over at the home where they were staying while they were in town to catch up with them. I had also been friends with a girl I'll call Julie, who was my age and Michael had been friends with Julie's younger brother Nate, who was his age. So Julie and Nate and their parents were also there visiting with Michael and his family. I had grown apart from Julie due to other reasons, but having everyone back together was fantastic. I was on cloud nine all day, to say the least. Julie's younger brother had been a bit of a handful when he was little. He had temper tantrums, kicked small animals, randomly screamed at me a couple of times, and would sometimes cry for no reason while claiming that somebody else had hurt him. He was severely, in my opinion, bullied by his sister, so I never took any of it personally or really considered it his fault. Since I hadn't seen much of him or his sister in years by this point, I had no idea how he was getting along, 
but because he was so much more grown up, four plus years had passed, I assumed he had just grown out of it. That afternoon, we all played tag in the front yard, which was sort of a U-shape and surrounded by hedges. At some point, I lost sight of the others. I guess they had gone inside or something. I was at the end of the U that was near the garage door, playing fetch with Michael's dog and his big walking stick. When I heard Julie's mom call my name from the other end of the U, which was near the house's front door, I took the stick because I thought leaving it lying around would be rude and started running around the U. Apparently, when Julie's mom had opened the door and called my name, Nate had darted out the door and come running around the U to come find me. Only, he didn't say anything and I didn't know he was there. We were both closer to the inside of the bend and when we reached the middle, there was no chance to stop. We ran straight into each other. He landed flat on his back and I nearly fell over too. His chin hit me hard in the collar though. We just stared at each other in shock for a second. Finally, I reached a hand forward to help him up and ask if he was okay. Immediately, his eyes filled with tears. He started screaming, seemingly in pain and in absolute terror, and turned around and bolted back the way he had come from. I knew he had to be bruised at least as badly as me, but was also totally confused. The way he was crying, I was afraid he might have broken an arm or a leg or something, but if he was hurt that bad, then how could he run so fast? Or, if he was afraid, what was he afraid of? I ran after him feeling like there was an axe murderer behind me or something. I reached the door, but nobody was there and it was closed and locked. I knocked and Michael's mother answered it. She saw me still holding the walking stick and looked confused, but let me inside nonetheless. I could hear Nate screaming and crying in the kitchen. His mother had him up on the counter and was looking him over trying to figure out what was wrong with him. She seemed just as confused and scared about the whole thing as I was. And then he saw me and immediately pointed and screamed. She beat me with a stick. He just screamed the same thing over and over again. I didn't know what to do, but seeing me seemed to make him hysterical, so I left him with his mother in the kitchen. I wanted to go find Michael and the others, but Michael's mom refused to let me go downstairs where he and the others were located, so I just stood by myself in the foyer next to the door and tried not to panic. Maybe Nate hadn't grown out of crying wolf about other people hurting him, but this was way different from what we had been like when he did that as a little kid. This time, he seemed hysterical and he seemed like he legitimately believed what he was saying. I had been holding the stick when we ran into each other, even though I certainly didn't hit him with it. Maybe he didn't understand what had really happened. I tried to go back into the kitchen, thinking that I should try to explain to his mom what had happened, but Michael's father stopped me. I don't even know where he came from. I must have been really freaked out, because from my perspective, it seemed like he just appeared in my way. He told me not to go into the kitchen. I tried to explain that I needed to talk to Nate's mother and explained, very shakingly, that Nate was telling her that I attacked him. So Michael's father asked, Did you? I told him no, of course not. He pointed out that I didn't seem to be hurt at all, which I refuted, telling him that I'd gotten my own bruises from running into Nate. He asked me to show him. I said no. He asked why. I pointed out, unnecessarily, I think, that I was a 14-year-old girl, so I couldn't just take my shirt off the way a 12-year-old boy could. He asked me why again, and persisted in stating that I needed to show him, and that if I didn't, he couldn't help me because he refused to give him any reason to think that I was innocent. This miserable SOB who had known me growing up, had allegedly been a close friend of my family for years, knew 
that I had never hit another kid in my life. He was essentially trying to blackmail me into undressing in front of him. I still feel angry just thinking about it, because the entire time my family had known him, he had always come off as perfect, kind, and even a caring father, and he had always found things to nitpick in whatever I said. Even as a first grader who didn't know what sex was, somehow I was allegedly spouting all kinds of innuendos all the time. And now this. I've learned as an adult that people who talk excessively about a topic generally do so because it occupies their own mind too frequently, and it makes me wonder if maybe that wasn't his problem all along. If not, I don't know how to explain anything. All I know is that night, it was like everyone I knew had gone insane at the same time, but I did say no to him and went into the kitchen, more to get away from him than anything else. Nate's mother was still frazzled, but it was starting to seem more aggravated than anything else. Somehow, he still hadn't stopped crying. I asked her to please call my mom to come pick me up. That hadn't been the plan. The plan was that I was to stay until after dinner, but I couldn't handle the situation anymore. She could see that I was shaking and agreed. I asked Michael's mother if I could say goodbye to any of the others, but she didn't want me anywhere near them. My mom was tense and quiet all the way home, and I was afraid of what she might have been told over the phone. She asked me, once, if there was anything I wanted to tell her. I panicked and said no. The next day was Sunday. I habitually stayed with the adults instead of going to the teen's class because the teacher, who was coincidentally Mary's husband, picked on me sometimes. In retrospect, I should have spoken up about that, but I was an insecure teenager. Though I might be oversensitive, I wasn't really sure how much of what he said could be considered harmless ribbing. The end result was that I didn't see Julie, so I had no idea how the situation with Nate had resolved until after church was over. The phrase, news spreads like wildfire, doesn't even begin to fit the bill. It was like everyone had developed telepathy. I overheard a part of the story from Nate's mother while she was telling it to Mary. Nate had continued to insist, even after I left, that I had savagely attacked and beat him for no reason. He had some pretty nice green bruises that seemed to back up his claims. I did too, right on my collarbone, and shaped exactly like his chin. Nate's mother was completely unnerved by how sincere he seemed, and was torn between believing him, because he was so grown up now, because there were those bruises, because he had been legitimately too scared to come up to church in case he saw me again, or not believing him, because I would seemed so scared too, because she had the decency to remember what kind of kid I'd been growing up. While I hadn't been there, Julia told all the girls in my class that I attacked her brother. Michael told me that he didn't know if he believed that I had done it or not, but his parents refused to let him stay in contact with me because they were both certain I was guilty. Julie and Nate's parents had wanted to talk to my mother to try to resolve whatever had happened because they were willing to give me the benefit of the doubt, but they couldn't find my mom and didn't want to take the time looking for her because they had left Nate home alone and were eager to get back to him. So instead they told the whole story about what happened to Mary, trusting that she would convey the whole situation to my mother. That was not what happened. Mary changed the story. Now it was Nate's parents, herself, and Michael's parents, who all knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that I was guilty, with the added insinuation that it might not have been just an assault, because apparently that wasn't good enough for her. Yeah, she decided to play that card just for the sheer fun of it, by the time I just started to realize that the issue with Nate was still an issue, half the people in the church had already been told what an awful, despicable person I was. The head of the youth ministry personally sat me down 
to tell me how unacceptable my behavior was. I had former teachers I hadn't seen since first grade coming out of the woodwork to tell me how disappointed they were in me. Everyone flat out refused to hear my side of the story. They already knew everything, they said. Nothing I said could make up for what I did. Mary had already told them I was a rebellious, lying kid, a troubled child, and had stuck to that story over the years, including during the pawn shop incident, so it seemed like there was a precedence. She had been building off the same claims about me for eight years by this point. Why would anyone believe a lying, rebellious, troubled teenager over a charismatic adult who was always doing her part to help the community? Mary was so disgusted with me, her words, that she refused to speak to me. She specifically told her yarn to everyone, but my mother, having learned early on that my mom was not going to stand for baseless rumors and accusations about me, Mary was of the opinion that my mom was in denial about what an awful kid I really was. Mary's husband, my current youth teacher, somehow snowed me into thinking that my mom knew about everything and that I shouldn't try to talk to her about it because she was so angry with me she would basically explode on me. I spent the next two and a half years despised by almost everyone I knew. All the adults I knew were against me except for the pastor who refused to take sides and my mother. Mary's husband continued to make snide remarks and insinuations whenever he thought they were vague enough that other adults wouldn't know what he was talking about. All the kids I knew who were in my age range shunned me, even when new kids came in who didn't know any better. They were quickly told to stay away from me, ruining any chance I had of making new friends to replace the ones I'd lost. Even random strangers in the grocery store would glare daggers at me, sneer at me, or just watch me with creepy disapproval. The shyness I'd always had became full-fledged social anxiety, complete with what I suspect was selective mutism, because I was afraid of virtually all the adults I knew, afraid of the little jabs they'd make at me, afraid because I didn't know if my mom knew or not and was afraid to find out. If she knew, if it was true that she was just so indifferent in reality, that even though I knew she loved me, for some reason, she still let everyone pick on me. It seems so stupid now that I was afraid of talking to her about it. If there were any one thing in my life I would choose to change, I would have told her immediately. But that isn't what happened, so I lived with it by myself. There were some mornings where I would just spend an hour in the shower crying my eyes out because I didn't want to have to go out and deal with it all over again. I don't know if you'll know what I mean when I say that having other people expect you to feel guilty is oppressive in and of itself when you laugh or smile or just feel normal, but they believe you should be ashamed of something and don't like it that you aren't. For a while I tried just not remembering what had happened. It is possible to make yourself forget something, but don't ever do that to yourself. Once you have a memory, you can't really destroy it. The best you can do is bury it. Part of your mind will still always know it's there. I still got all the same judgmental looks and hurtful remarks. I just no longer understood why people were acting that way. And I had all kinds of awful nightmares until I finally dug those memories back up and faced them again. I got over it eventually but slowly. So many people who had known me the entire time I was growing up had immediately assumed the worst just because some gossip had told them to. I never knew who had been told and who hadn't. Every time I thought people had forgotten, Mary's husband would make some new cutting remark, or someone else would, and I'd lose whatever sense of security I started to scrape together. It was only in my early 20s a few years after we'd moved out of the state, that I finally found the courage to bring up the subject with my mother. 
which led to some interesting revelations. It turned out that Nate's mother hadn't divulged anything about what had happened over the phone. My mom had been tense on the drive home because of something totally unrelated to me and had asked if I wanted to talk, not because she thought I was guilty about anything, but because she could tell I was under stress of some kind. Mary's husband had lied through his teeth about her knowing what was going on or being angry about it. She had never known. That was why Mary's husband had always tiptoed around the subject in her presence, because he knew she didn't know and wanted to keep it that way. It was practically a conspiracy. My mom, the one person who actually had a right to know what had happened, had been denied the opportunity to try to make things right because everyone else was so busy judging me for themselves. Also, Nate's parents, the two people who actually had a semi-balanced view of that night, had no idea how bad things had gotten after they left that day because they didn't live in our area anymore and weren't there to see it themselves. If they had, I'd like to think they would have put a stop to it. They were good people. That is the end, I guess. I don't have nightmares anymore, and I feel more or less indifferent to the situation now. It's over a decade behind me at this point. But Mary, and your husband, holy crap, I never want to meet either of you again for as long as I live. All of that stress and fear and heartache I've mentioned here and that's still not even mentioning how much you badmouthed my mom behind her back, gushed over her cancer scare because it gave you something to gossip over, and generally treated us both like dirt. I never want to meet Michael's father again either, because whether he's a pervert or just too dense to realize how wildly inappropriate he was being doesn't really matter at this point. Either way, it was still beyond creepy and wrong. Never meeting Michael again is still kind of painful to think about, but I guess it can't really be helped. I even tried contacting him on Facebook a few years ago, but to no avail. I already know Julie and Nate never want to meet me again. I guess that makes this a sort of round robin. Let's not meet.